Well, at this point, we've seen two examples, and I've used the word. I've said that these are examples of fractals, but just what is a fractal? In this brief lecture, I want to say something about what that word fractal means. What we've seen in these examples is a familiar process from an earlier part of the course. What we're doing is recursion. But earlier in the course, typically when we did a recursion, it, we were creating a sequence of numbers. And here we're doing this in sort of a geometric way. That is to say, rather than generating a sequence of numbers, or each number depends in some way on the preceding numbers in the sequence, we're creating a sequence of uh, geometric objects, where each geometric object in the sequence is obtained from the previous object by some sort of a process. We've seen that in both of the examples that we've done thus far, both the, the Coke curve and snowflake, and also in the example of the uh, Sierpinski uh, triangle. Now, another difference between this and what we were doing earlier is that we don't really want to think about stopping at any finite stage in the sequence. What we want to do is we want to imagine the result of carrying the process on indefinitely. So the finite stages or the finite steps in the construction, what we call the seed or stage zero, stage one, stage two, stage three, etc., are approaching, as we can see, some sort of limiting object. And that object is the thing that we think of as the fractal. Now, even though we want to imagine the result of carrying on the process indefinitely, we already have a good idea of what the fractal looks like at an early stage, say stage five or stage six. As you can see in both of these examples, it looks very broken or fractured. And that's just what the Latin word fractus means. So in 1975, a mathematician named Benoit Mandelbrot coined this term, and it's really quite clever. So he intended to use that Latin root fractus and suggest this idea of something that looks very broken or fractured. It has an additional benefit, namely this word fractal also suggests the word fraction. And as we'll see towards the end of our study, that's also an appropriate usage. Now, there's a little handout that I want to direct your attention to. It's, I believe, three pages, maybe four pages. Uh, and it has basic vocabulary and examples. This was what it looks like at the beginning of the first page. And you can use this as a guide to what we do as we go through the study of fractals. I want to go over a little bit of that right now, because I think we're now ready to see what fractals are all about. Now, they're not easily described by traditional geometry. As we've seen, these are examples. These two examples that we've seen are examples that somehow arose in 20th century uh, mathematics. At that point, there was not an understanding of this as a separate field on its own. But in the course of studying other parts of mathematics, this field uh, began to emerge. And when I say that I have a definition here, this is not a definition in the sense that you sometimes have very precise definitions in mathematics. So for example, if I use the word sequence, you know exactly what I mean by that. that there no, there's no question about it. On the other hand, fractal is kind of a more nebulous, not quite precisely defined term. It's more of the idea this is a field of study there are things that have certain properties, and we recognize them as fractals, but we don't actually have a, a checklist we can go down and, and given any object, say, oh, well, that's definitely a fractal, or that's definitely not. So we're looking for something that has the kind of properties that's listed here, and we're not being absolutely demanding that it satisfy each and every one of these things. Now, here is my list, uh, I've tried to, to pull out what I think are the salient features, some of which we've already seen and others we're going to see as we go along. The first is that it has a broken or fractured appearance. The second thing, which maybe we haven't thought much about, but 
you kind of see it already emerging in these examples, is that these objects appear much the same at all magnifications. That is to say, if we look at the whole object or if we look at a small piece of the object by zooming in, it seems to be roughly the same and, and sometimes is uh, precisely the same. So we're going to talk about that uh, some more using an idea that's called self-similarity. The third property that I want to mention is that fractals are not easily described by traditional geometry. And therefore, they might appear to be uh, naturally generated objects rather than man-made ones. The fourth thing, which we have not yet seen, well, we've seen it kind of. We've, we've seen that it's defined by a recursive procedure. We haven't seen anything about what's called a dynamical system. At this point, you, you won't know what those words mean. I'll explain that term when we get to it. But we've certainly seen uh, objects defined by some sort of a recursive procedure here. And then the last thing I can only hint at at the moment, what we'll it'll eventually see for many of these objects is that they have a dimension which is not a whole number. So they're not one-dimensional objects, and they're not two-dimensional objects or three-dimensional objects, but there's something else. They li might be like one-and-a-half-dimensional objects. Now, that may sound like the craziest thing you've ever heard. How can something have one-and-a-half dimensions? But we'll see that actually there's lots of ways to make sense of something like that. It can be very helpful for a deeper understanding of these objects called fractals. So as I say, this is our basic list of properties that might be possessed by objects called fractals. And as we go on in the unit, you might want to keep these things in mind. We'll learn what these terms mean in more depth as we explore each of these ideas in turn.